when I record it. It tends to be easy. Like we're friends or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we've talked before. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to Fuck Wellness. I'm Mallory. I'm McKenna. And it's just us. <laughs> just little old us. <laughs> Wait, Mal, we have to change our names. Oh, yeah. Uno momento. Uh, yeah. One second. We're not prepared to start. We got too excited. Too into it. Dun, dun, dun. Um, all right. I just have to turn this on. Do not disturb. Where is Lara right now? Lara is in Amsterdam. Like in the Netherlands? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right now? Right this second. Oh, I do remember her vaguely <laughs> telling us about this. I mean, she didn't even ask me for any recommendations. Oh my god, you should text her. No, I'm kind of hurt. I don't want to give her any advice now. It's been, <laughs> it's been like weird. I think. Sorry, my eyes. Oh, I'm having the light thing happen, happen mm. to me again. Where did my glasses go? Oh my god, are we doing another <laughs> podcast with sunglasses on? No, like actually, yeah. Okay, just give me. <laughs> Let me see. Let me see if it gets better, and then if it doesn't, I'll I'll go get it. But I won't be able to focus if it doesn't get better. Okay. Wow, I had no idea she was in Amsterdam. Well, that's great. When she was texting yeah. us about traveling, I thought she was just in San Francisco. <laughs> no, no. So I, a live update. And she was is like, that... "We're doing museums," and I was like, "Oh, that's <laughs> nice that you're exploring museums." <laughs> Everything makes so much more sense now. Wow. No, yeah, everyone. Lara's currently in Amsterdam. Wow. And yeah, she's exploring. It was kind of a last minute trip, which is like yay for her. Um, so yeah, it looks beautiful there. I it's literally you're not on Snap. Yeah. That's where all the updates come is Snapchat. I, just, I know I can't manage another social media platform. I can't. Mm -hmm. I can do one and that's it. Um, that's I, so fair. I literally, like, gun to my head, could not have told you that she was in Amsterdam. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> I feel really I can't bad. believe we didn't talk about that when we talked a couple days ago. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I feel like I'm coming to this podcast with McKenna energy. Oh my God. What does that mean? It means that I've had like 7 million realizations this week. <laughs> yeah. I feel like usually I come to the pod and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm excited to listen to McKenna and Lara. And like, I don't always like have a lot to like in my own life. And mm -hmm. this week I'm like, I feel like my brain has been shattered into 10 million pieces. And I'm, I feel like it was wrung out. Like as if you're yeah, like wringing out it. a towel, you know? That's how I feel every week of the year. I know. And I can't imagine feeling like this all of the time. Like my brain would explode. Yeah. Um. Before we get into that, I think that we should give like a quick where we're at in the world update. Yeah. <clears throat> um, This is the first time that we have recorded Um. since there's, I mean, it's no secret that there's significant unrest in the world right now. And I think that Mal and I and Laura too, when we've talked to her, has just kind of struggled with a way to come to the table with that conversation in a way that accurately shows, I guess, kind of how we feel about the situation while also holding empathy that um, there's a lot of kind of intense discourse on social media right now. And I don't know. It's it feel it, the the issue itself doesn't feel complicated, but the surrounding kind of discussions about it do feel kind of like the these waters to go into that are a little bit scary and and I I think that we're or me personally I guess I don't know how to I don't want to put words in your mouth Mal but like struggle with do I even am I even allowed to feel discomfort in that at all like that's not really fair I think on some level so um yeah I mean I I Mal you can cut this part out if you want but like I feel very comfortable with my stance on 
that what is happening in Palestine is absolutely horrific and should not be, um, I don't know, I guess we should use our voices any way that we possibly can to make that known. Um, This is a history that is decades long that I think we have the privilege of not knowing about it before it happened, which is which is so unreal that that happened. I mean, I think, Mal, you probably have had more maybe education than I have about the history of Israel and Palestine um, and free Palestine movement. But I don't know. I think that there's layers on layers, again, not with like our actual stances and where we stand on the issue or where I stand on the issue, but maybe with how to navigate with what we're seeing on social media. Yeah. I I generally feel the same way. I took a whole class on this in college and I remember like on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and I think I left understanding how many layers there are to that conflict and how like it's it's just like we can just talk about land and borders but it's so much mm-hmm. deeper than land and borders like there are so many like religious factors and believing that God like gave them the land and there's like so much nuance to this like it doesn't feel as simple to me as like you know this person the this group deserves the land this group doesn't Mm -hmm. but I I think I fully agree that what is happening right now is genocide and has has been I mean they've been that population the Palestinians have been targeted for almost like 80 years now um and Israel is powerful like they are there it is a power dynamic um but then I you know it's like I also feel like you can't say that with all without also being like yeah but there's I also understand why Israel feels like that land is important to them and that they really value it and there has been like violence on both sides for a long time like it's not just a one-sided conflict. Anyway, I'm certainly not an expert on this topic. And I think that's why I felt a little bit uncomfortable speaking about it in like kind of a linear way that feels like what social media is doing right now, Mm -hmm. which is like, okay, take a hundred percent stance on one side or take a hundred percent stance on the other side, because that's not how I feel. Like, that's just Mm -hmm. not how I am as a thinker. Like my Mm -hmm. brain doesn't work like that. Like I've never been really fully comfortable giving a hundred percent like being so sure in my opinion of something, like, I just always feel like there's more that we can know. And Mm -hmm. I've, I've struggled with like, what does that mean for my advocacy? Like, does that mean I'm just going to be quiet on all of the things that happen? Because I'm, I'm sure there's more nuance there. So I think I've been struggling with that a little bit. Um, but yeah, social media has been very wild recently, um, and has made it, like really hard for me to want to say anything, especially if what I'm saying is like, it's complicated, but generally I'm, I'm in support of human rights, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's, it's hard. <clears throat> yeah. And I think that for my kind of takeaways to wrap this up, because we can post, we posted some resources on, on Instagram uh, last week. So we can put those again in the show notes and we have some more that, I've been compiling to and that I've utilized. So I can put those in there as well as people who I've been kind of following to stay updated and and learn more. But I think my kind of three takeaways are number one, like not to look away from what's happening. I think that's a really important takeaway. It's a, such a privilege to not have, you know, our lives be completely disrupted. But I also think it's kind of apocalyptic, not that they're not like watching this happen on the world stage and just being like, yeah, now I have this really stupid meeting to go to that doesn't mean anything. And no one's acknowledging what's happening in the world. I think that's very, very strange to me. So I, I would just encourage everyone not to look away and just really, really take a long, hard look at what's happening and how you can, you know, make your voice heard in in the subject matter. I think number two, my takeaway would be to use your discernment, especially on social media. And then number three, I think it's just important that we remember our humanity. And if you find yourself like activated in some way, 
just remember that how you speak to people is important and it matters and we don't get anywhere with, you know, calling each other names. Yeah. I feel like the whole, I've been really struggling with the, like, make your voice heard because Mm -hmm. sometimes I'm like, is my voice really necessary in this yeah. conversation? I'm like, well, are I'm you not... speaking on social media specifically? Yeah. Like yeah. I feel like it's different. Like I've had conversations with GW students for the past two weeks, nonstop about this. Mm-hmm. Like that to me is one way that like I am using my voice is like to mm-hmm. help mediate and like have conversations with my students about what they're experiencing but social media has not felt like the place that I wanted to have that conversation. And I feel I some guilt around that because I'm mm-hmm. like, there are people on social media right now who are like, if you're not speaking up on social media, like you are, you know, part of the problem. Yeah. And to me, it's like, I do or sometimes feel like I'm like, you support genocide if you're not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think to some degree, it's like, I feel like I'm impacting I feel like I'm impacting the conversation in my sub community. And sometimes that's the best way for you Mm -hmm. to actually make an impact on the population. I think the other thing that I've been thinking about a lot too is it's, it's hard when there are so many bad things happening Mm -hmm. in the world. Like this is obviously like so so awful and then there's also so much other like terrible stuff happening like the Uyghurs in China like there's so many other examples of like oppressed groups and societies happening in real time as well and I can I can empathize that I think it is overwhelming to be Mm -hmm. like I I want to look away because how can I accept all of the pain and suffering and trauma that people are dealing with. And I think it's a balance to me of like, I remember someone during, at some point it was like empathy or knowledge, empathy, knowledge, action. And I feel like that's been the cycle I've been trying to go back to is leading with empathy, learning within my capacity, like what I can, and then trying to come up with like one action step Mm -hmm. Um, because we can't be everywhere all at once. Like we can't be thinking about every thing in the world, but we can do small things to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, um, I forget where I heard this. Oh, I I'm reading this book on CPTSD and, um, there's this kind of idea of good enough. Like we can, we can combat some perfectionism by being good enough. And obviously this was, is within a trauma lens. And so you can be like the good enough parent. Like we don't have to be the absolute perfect parent for an example, but I think sometimes when it comes to world conflicts that we are kind of like the United States is complicit in, like we obviously can't carry all of that weight on our shoulders, but we have to carry some. And so I think that part of that is like, can I be, a good enough ally in this and make my voice heard in a good enough way without centering it on myself or without feeling like I'm performing in that activism, you know, there's, cause then if we get stuck in that cycle of perfectionism, like nothing ever happens. Um, and I think that's just also being open to like being as considerate as you can in the, in the privileged spaces that we hold, while also hoping that if we fumble a bit, there's someone in our communities, whether it's our personal community or our online community, who would be willing to kind of pull us aside and say, hey, you missed the mark a little bit here. Can I help? Can we talk about this a little more? You know? Yeah. Okay. Um. So yeah, just, I think it's important to kind of center the, those dynamics before we go in and talk about um. Well, sometimes you like silly little problems in our personal lives right now. Um, it doesn't mean they're not worthy of being kind of debriefed or talked about, but um, yeah, it's important to acknowledge. And just so you guys know that there's a lot of internal discussions that are happening and I don't know, we are, we aren't like, I just don't feel good right now about being like 
and normal podcasts, normal social media, like everything is not normal. And so I don't think we should treat it as such. Yeah. Yep. All right. Updates. You want to go first? I want to hear about uh, the wet towel that you need to wring out. Mm, I think you should go first. Really? Why? Well, because mine are all kind of connected and I feel like they would take a while. Okay. You need to weave them together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I can go first. Um, I just to kind of up quick update. I am currently in San Francisco, which is like kind of a wild whirlwind. I drove home from Colorado Friday night and Saturday of this last weekend, um, the third weekend in October. And then on Sunday, Tegan, my sister, she helped me move um, a couple carloads of stuff into my new apartment and Lara's new apartment in San Francisco. And that is where I am right now. Last night, I spent the first night there. And I've been dealing with a lot of conflicting emotions about San Francisco in general. And I have like this whole kind of write up that I'm going to eventually do. But to summarize, like, this was never my plan. (laughs) And I feel really like, kind of like I'm someone's sim right now like someone put me in here and is like and now you're gonna live in a city which is not it's not my vibe like I it's just not it's just not that being said um I love our street our street is just the cutest calmest guy little guy and our apartment is gorgeous um and so I feel really like safe and and comfy and cozy there but it's almost like once again, I am in a video game because it's like, and I'm going to work from home and I'm going to stay in this home until Lara gets back and she'll, she'll go other places with me just because it not like in reality, but I just feel really, um, anxious about exploring alone. Yeah. Not for necessarily for safety reasons, but just like, this feels like, I don't know this area, like Boulder. It was fine because it's like, these are my, these feel like it feels like my home, you know, like I, well, but you also had to figure out if you were there by yourself for such a long time and you had to figure it out. I mean, Mm -hmm. you didn't have a safety net. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, like I wouldn't, that was a level of difficulty. I feel like I could manage. I don't think I could manage this level of difficulty alone. And I'm going to have to on some level, but I definitely feel like I'm using Laura as a crutch a little bit when she gets back. Um, So yeah, I think I'm, I'm interested to see over the next few weeks how I feel about it. And because on my drive here, like I would say I've been feeling neutral positive. I've been feeling really excited to live with Laura and really excited to live in this apartment. But other than that, I've been feeling neutral about Mm -hmm. everything. It just kind of was like, oh, well, I guess this is what I'm doing now because there wasn't anything else to do. And when I was driving in yesterday, I started kind of feeling really excited, which I didn't expect. And I just like felt kind of, honestly a little bit alive for the first time and maybe that's just because I was like huh I have my own space now like this is mine um because there's still a lot of things that need to be figured out and like I need another job like ASAP like there are a lot of things that I have to do that I don't necessarily feel like I have the bandwidth for right now but um that's how I'm feeling about San Francisco is Douglas there Douglas is here. Yeah. Poor guy is really sick and I feel terrible. He has such a bad ear infection and he's just like so uncomfortable, but he's napping right now. So it's just good. Has he been transitioning okay into the apartment so far? Um, I mean, we haven't even been here 24 hours, mm, okay. so I think it's time will tell. I think medium. Medium. Okay. Yeah. He just, he's not used to like big noises. And we, I mean, we live on a quiet street, but like you can hear our neighbors and he's just not used to like that. So he is feeling like a little startled. Like there are people in our house kind of, it mm-hmm. feels like to him. Um, So he's been barking a little bit, but we'll work on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Okay. Juicy stuff. Are we ready? <laughs> okay. So Um, I was in Colorado because I went to go nanny for eight days, which, um, ended up being really went really, really smoothly. I was by myself with the two kids for eight days, which other than the fact that like it, it got kind of lonely. I 
really, it was a lot easier than I thought it would be. And I have more thoughts that I want to, I want to take some time to sit on and then talk about later, just about what I feel like that meant for me with motherhood and like how I can kind of, not that obviously they're not my kids, but just, it made me think more about, Mm -hmm. oh, I definitely was so excited to go to work in the morning, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. every morning. Um, And just what that means and the importance I now feel, not now, but have always felt of like doing this with someone who is a true partner is like a non-negotiable and just how hard it would be to do it by myself. Um, And yeah, so I think that went, that went pretty well. However, the first weekend that I was there was horrible for me. Um, and for per- more personal reasons, and then it's hard when you're around kids because you can't necessarily be like, I need a, I need a breakdown right now. <laughs> it's like, you have to be the one that's the regulator and you can't be the, you know, it, you just can't. And so you have to compartmentalize a bit. And I just had a hard time with that. That was the weekend that Laura had decided she was going to go to Amsterdam. So it kind of moved up her moving timeline. And her and her dad end up taking like a truck of, of stuff up here, like some of our big furniture, which was so helpful. Um, and then the rest of Laura's stuff, I think, but it kind of created the situation kind of unintentionally where then I had to, I was stressing that when I would arrive back in California, I didn't have any help because we were originally kind of going to do it together. I didn't have anyone help to like move my stuff or into the apartment or even how to get it from Davis to San Francisco. So that was kind of just like making me stressed. I I think it's just like, it's no one's fault. It just like the circumstances didn't line up how I thought that they were. And it kind of made me spiral a bit. Um, but in that same weekend, I was on social media and that is when a lot of, you know, um, Israel, Palestine stuff started happening. And I was kind of trying to learn and process that while caring for these kids who were missing their parents. And then on top of this moving situation. And then thirdly, um, a really like close high school friend got married and I'm not close with them anymore, but I was in high school and I was seeing all these pictures on social media and it was like, uh, like our whole high school group was there and it felt like, except for me. And, um, I, like fully spiraled, like had a full, full spiral moment. And it was just, it was as I kind of, I don't know, go through more therapy and am at kind of a better place with myself. I've just realized like, it doesn't take the hurt away. It doesn't take painful situations away, of course, but it makes your ability to sit in them not easier, but maybe more tolerable but that doesn't mean it it wasn't really uncomfortable. So like in the past, I would have had this experience happen and then I would have gone very external and like it it would have um, manifested in like intense anxiety for something. But this time I just was like, this really sucks. And I could sit with that like pit in my stomach and it was the heaviest pit for like three days. And there's no way to like, you just have to process the emotions. I couldn't think my way out of it. I couldn't I couldn't do anything but just sit there kind of like grief in a way like you just have to sit there and it has to move through you and no one can like speed that process along at all. So it was just hard and part of it was because in high school we used to kind of talk about our weddings and kind of more than I think I realized we did and one of the things was like with this person my friend group would always say like oh we think that this person's going to get married first. And then the next, like, it'll either be this person or it'll be McKenna. Those are the two people that we think that will get married first in our friend group and not to each other, obviously. (laughs) And like, I just think that seeing him and my friends, like in this different stage of life that I'm nowhere near is, was really hard. And seeing all these people together that I still really love and care about, but I have lost touch with is really hard. And I know I have more things on how I noticed how that showed up for me, but I just think that that situation is something that probably people can relate to, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, and I noticed that a lot of it, I turned internal. I was like, 
I got so mean to myself and I was like, you ruined all of these friendships and that's why you're not there. Mm. Like you are at fault for all of it, which is not true. But if that's what I felt like at the time. Yeah. I was curious what your default was. Yeah. 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 And part of it is because like, oh, maybe it's because I chose to move away and everyone else kind of stayed local, you know, or Mm -hmm. um, there are things that I don't know, during that time in my life, when I started to drift away from them, it was right after my grandma died. And I very much acknowledged that I was not a fun person to be around at that time. Like, I think that I was processing a death of a parent, basically. And I had no idea how to do that. And the people in my life had no idea how to receive that. And so it did come out in me being just kind of an irritable person and a depressed person. And so I don't think that that's like, that is 100% a factor. But then there also were some people in that friend group where I didn't feel like I was being valued. And so I removed myself from some of those situations, knowing that it would, that would have put me on the outside, you know? Do you feel like seeing this made you want to reconnect with them in any way or was it more of like nostalgia like grief that this isn't how it turned out I think both I think I felt both at the same time Mm -hmm. um yeah I mean I don't think that there's like a perfect way to I don't know to feel about it um I can read what I said but one of the things that I, I wrote down, I was like, I, I, it clicked for me. I was like, this is a pattern. It was like, I was activated because this thing makes me feel really alone, not feeling heard or understood and left out. Or I wrote down discarded or thrown out. Like those are really visceral feelings for me. Yeah. And what happens to me when that, when then I have that activation is that I have really extremes of emotion. So like really high or really low. And then I default to extreme hyper independence. I just like, I, I found myself like, and I'm going to say this cause I feel obviously safe with you Mal and like, we can talk about it, but it's like my, your brain does such powerful things. It's like brings up all the people in my life that I feel like are my people now. And even I talked to Laura a little bit about this cause she was aware of the situation too. And she was like, Ken, like, like, but those aren't your people. Like we see you on such a deep level and like, and, and I, she's so right. Like that is 100% the case. But in my mind, it was like this hyper independence was like, well, Mal doesn't like you. Well, Lara doesn't like you. Well, Bella doesn't like all of these people that I hold so close to me or it's like, well, they're lying. This is going to happen with them. Like this yeah. is, and I, and I just felt myself pushing like everyone away and I really don't like that part of myself. It's really hard for me because it's such a broken part that feels like I'm trying to like hold the world on my shoulders. And it's like, I'm so stubborn that it just like, doesn't, it's not a good combination. And so that was just like a hard, a hard thing. Um, yeah. Convincing myself that like everyone hates me and, um, makes me like have this very flight emotion. Like I need to run. I need to move. I need to run away. I need to move abroad. I need to do with these things. And that's just like, not true. I feel like this was, I feel like this is such a powerful example of parts work because Mm -hmm. I just, I literally just finished, um, no bad parts last night. Oh my God. We need Um, to talk about that. And I just feel like the example you're giving is like such a good example of a protector, like Mm -hmm. turning on, but like three layers of protectors, like hiding Mm -hmm. this little exile, you know? Yeah. Because it sounds like the like hyper independence was, was like your coping mechanism Mm -hmm. in that situation. It was like, all you really could do in that moment is like almost like the get out feeling. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, it sounds like that situation was a really good trailhead for you. (laughs) You're right. Therapist Mallory. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I've just been thinking about trailhead so much because, and you're, you're always so good at this. And I feel like you give me a lot of language for it, but like coming at situations like that with curiosity Mm -hmm. instead of 
like judgment Mm -hmm. and being like, okay, I felt my reaction be this where, where do I feel like that came from in my body? Mm -hmm. Or like, where do I feel like, like, was that a pattern? Um, I feel like you're always so good at that. And I, I really heard that in what you were saying. Thanks. Yeah. And I think, honestly, I think the more that I learn, the less that I know (laughs) about almost everything Mm -hmm. in my life and about people. And I, it's kind of everything is more simple than we think and yet more complicated. And I think this is a perfect situation where I was able to show compassion for myself in moments where if this situation had happened a year ago, two years ago, four years ago, it would have killed me to see that, you know, like I, I, it would have taken me weeks to recover from something like that versus two days of extreme discomfort. Um, it also led me to kind of have some more reflection time of like, huh, I put all the blame on myself and I'm not to blame only in this situation. Like not to be like so cliche, but the phone does work both ways. <laughs> like this is, yeah. and it and it's okay. Like I don't love them any less for, I'm not m- less excited for him. You know, like this is just an unfortunate circumstance where I had to choose myself when I was younger and it unfortunately led to a little bit more isolation. Um, But yeah, I think like it led to some reflections of the fact that I have difficulty asking for things that I want. And then when I do have kind of the bravery to ask for that, sometimes it comes out in a casualness. I think this has happened with like you and Laura before, where it's like, I feel like I took this it feels to me like I leaped off this big cliff and said, can we please do this? And then if it's not like heard and if we don't do it, it feels catastrophic because I'm like, I just like bared my soul to you. Like (laughs) I need you guys to do this simple thing. Even if it's like, oh, we had no idea that it was like that meaningful to you, but it's just, I don't have practice in that. Like I have practice in being like, yeah, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I I need to sleep. I need, that's easy for me to advocate for. It's not easy for me to advocate of like, I want us to spend this time doing this specific thing together. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately that I'm going to talk in therapy about this on Wednesday, but like that sometimes leads me to be resentful to people for not like, anticipating my needs in a way, which is not fair. Um, and really that's a parent's job. So <laughs> that's like another, another component, but I let the last thing on this. And then I want you to go Mal is that I had this dream a few nights later. I, sometimes when I go to sleep, I kind of ask, I'm like, can you guys show me in my dream? Like you guys, meaning, I don't know the universe, like, can you show me something I need to know right now? Like, what do I need to hear? What do I need to know? And I um, had this really intense dream where I had set up this event for people and um, I arrived at the event and I walk up and it's, it was like a weird stadium. It was like, there's something in the middle. I don't know what the event was. There was like a bleacher set to like the North of it, the event. And then there was one on the West and one on the East and the bleacher set to the North was full of people. Like I had so, so, so many people. And when I walked into the stadium, I could hear all those people in there, like calling my name and be like, Oh my God, there's McKenna. And I looked up and it's like my family and like people that I know, like it's not strangers. And then I walk up to where I know my seat is supposed to be with all of my friends. And I get up there and like, um, my friends are there and they turn to me and they're like, oh, like there are no more seats up here. And I was like, what? Like, what do you mean there are no more seats? And they're like, oh, sorry. Like you can go sit over there. And it was like across the bleachers. There was no one. There was no one in that section. It would be me all by myself. And I remember being like, why wouldn't someone save me a seat? Why wouldn't someone think ahead and save me a seat? And I just think that was like such symbol. And I was like, I'm not sitting over there. (laughs) I'm not sitting there alone. And some of my friends being like, come on, it's not a big deal. Like just go over there and sit by yourself. Like, it's just like the way the cookie crumbles. And I remember feeling this just intense emotion in the dream. And it's so silly, the example, but it, that's the model that is applied to all areas of my life. It's like, I am like little me is really yearning for someone to say, Mm -hmm. Hey, I thought about you. And I got you this, I don't know. I went to store and I got you this matcha because I was thinking about you. Like I have the dearest, kindest friends, but like, that's like, you can't, I don't know. Like 
that is, I think, just something that I'm missing from my life. That's, and obviously everyone does kind things for me. I'm not saying that like you or Laura, those like close people don't, but I think I just funny to hear like what that little me inside is really, really searching for. And it's for someone to like, take care of her. Sorry, Ryan just walked out of the, sh- the shower. Area. Oh, in a towel. I didn't yes. even see. Um, I think that all makes so much sense. And yeah, I th- I think a lot of it is just there is holes there, you yeah. know, like yeah, holes that. I, and I and I think even if you had people in your life who were doing that all of the time, I still don't mm-hmm. feel like it would meet the need in the exact way that you would need it to. So no, because it's a primal need. It's yes. not. It's not a material need. It's a primal need. Yeah. So like you're like Swiss cheese and, Mm -hmm. you know, I can't plug the cheese all the time. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I hope you don't feel like you have to. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no. And, and part of me working on my brain and doing trauma healing is like, I am creating those little cheese holes or cheese plugs to go in those holes. And it's worked. I've, I've plugged a few, but it's Mm -hmm. like, there's always going to be a layer that's there. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. That was so long. No, that was great. Should we wrap up or yeah. should, okay. Well, okay. Full disclosure. This wasn't an accidental. I talked for so long. Mal and I had pre-planned, pre-planned that we were going to wait for a natural stopping point And we would, we were going to make two episodes out of this. We're doing a long recording day. So I do think that's a good kind of spot to land. Do you feel like it's good? Yeah. I'm making sure Ryan's not naked. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think that was good. And I, I didn't mean to say it like that, but I meant more like, no, no, no. I think the other topic that you wanted to talk about will fit well into the next one. Yeah. I'm excited. And also, sorry, just a quote closing thought here. I know sometimes for me, I'm always like when I hear a warning or like a, I don't know, an after care so for like a better word uh discussion it's like if what I just said made your body feel something like that is really normal and if you were listening and you're like this is just too much like honestly like reach out to me we can talk about it I don't want you to feel alone in those situations like if you need a friend or talk to your friends or talk to me truly um because these these conversations kind of are sneaky and how they can impact you. And I think that even if you can't relate to my specific example, you probably can relate to some of the feelings on some level of the spectrum. So that's my kind of sign off is to take care of yourself. Yeah. Thanks Mal for listening. Mal didn't hear any of that. I was like, Mal, I have juicy stuff to tell you. And I am not going to tell you until the pod because one, I knew you'd react in the most perfect way. And two, I just didn't think that I had the energy to do it twice. Yeah. I also feel like one thing people repeatedly say about our podcast is how much they appreciate it sounding like a phone call among friends. Like, I feel like people over and over again are like, it's just so, it's so fun to feel like I'm a part of your friendship and not be there necessarily so but I, they are here no no, no I know but like yeah. not literally but I hear you, yeah. here yeah um and so I think this is a great example of we would have just had a phone call where we talked about literally mm-hmm. the same things but now people get to be a part of it yeah yep okay. we need community y'all yeah well catch us on a commune yeah <laughs> like, oh also last thing after yeah. that podcast my mom was like Mallory did you know that I have been planning a commune with my friends since I was 20. And I was like, no. And mom actually had the best idea that when she and her friends get to a certain age, they're Mm going to start living together so that they can provide care for everyone in the space. So, you know, whoever has the most faculties at that time will kind of be the (laughs) caretaker for everyone else. And they won't necessarily- Or you could pull resources and- Mm -hmm. And and get a person for everyone. Exactly. So I was like, that's so funny, mom. I was like, I'm planning to maybe do that a little bit younger than- I'm planning to do that for- for our child years. Honestly. Yeah, I told her. I think it's a great idea. No. Anyway, this is 
I would say our five-year plan. I'm very yeah. confident in saying our five-year plan. Oh yeah. Are you on board, Mallory? I I don't feel like I'm. I feel like Laura is the one you. I have know. To I was gonna say that. you and I yeah. need to be on the same page, and then we can gently coerce Laura. Yeah, I definitely don't think I'm the problem here. Not you that Laura's the problem, but you know. I think that you and me are on the five-year plan in terms of commune. Laura's on a ten-year plan in terms of commune. I think she's so not you know, on a plan. <laughs> Love, that's not a bad thing you know? no no I'm just Dang. saying I feel like Laura is less comfortable with like planning out her years in the yeah. way that we are mm-hmm. yeah and I don't know life come that comes at you fast things yeah. could be different in a year that's also what I was thinking about with the story is like in one year I could be dude I could have a baby in a year like I don't want well I do want a baby but I don't I want it in the perfect circumstances <laughs> But you know not what I mean? Not perfect, good enough. Not perfect, good enough. Yeah, everything can change in one year. Okay, we need yeah. to go so I can hear Mal's story. Okay, bye. Okay, bye.